to bring things back to MarTech and the real reason uh, you know you guys are are here, I want to invite up Lisa Hook, CEO of Newstar. Hi, right, Lisa. So it was two years ago you and I were sitting here. Exactly. And at the time, uh, I think I, I, I um, w we talked about your evolution as a company going from sort of like a telco government services uh, contractor to a MarTech leader making a series of acquisitions to develop a, a whole MarTech stack. A lot of things have happened in those uh, two years. We've seen uh, this notion, uh, this is migration away from cookies towards known identities in the marketplace. Um, we've had uh, uh, the kind of challenges in the advertising supply chain that have, that have uh, made it sort of necessary to, to uh, address things like fraud and ensure that you know, people were properly seeing and paying for what they, were thought, they thought they were. And then uh, we saw significant data breaches, Yahoo, Equifax, where this whole notion of security, which heretofore had really not been a marketer concern, uh, come, come to the fore. And it feels like all of those things uh, are like the market coming to you because you laid the foundation. Two years ago, you stood here, or sat here, and, and, and talked about your unique sort of approach to identity and to security. I'm guessing that for a good 50% of the audience, they were like, well, what are you talking about? I mean, yeah, maybe 80 the- 80% of the audience. Right, okay, 80% yeah. of the And yet, holy smokes. We planned it that way. Exactly. Um, yeah, well, I would say, if I could, we never actually set out to be a MarTech company. Right. And that's specifically because when I met Terry at the end of 2010, and he showed me the Loomiscape it was so terrifying that we decided not to go into this industry. <laughs> um, and stuck with our original plan, which was to utilize all of our 20-year-old businesses, which are all in network addressing, to extract identifier fragments and put together a unique authoritative identity that could be used in risk, fraud, and compliance, used in threat analytics, and perhaps if the market developed, used in marketing analytics. Okay. You've been a great teacher for us, so thank you for all the many years that you've put up with our accidental intelligence, which is <laughs> what we call AI um, inside <laughs> Newstar. <laughs> and believe me, it is completely accidental. But uh, you know, I we're feeling quite fortunate um, that that the market does seem to be converging. And again, we we're sticking with our really simple thesis: it's all transactions of all types are going to become real time. Mm -hmm asynchronous communication is disappearing. Whether it's on the phone or online, it's critical to know who or what is on the other end of the transaction, right? Is it a bad guy right. that you want to block, threat analytics? Is it Lisa Hook trying to buy $20,000 worth of Prada shoes? No, don't let her. Or is it somebody that you want to sell something to? So really, it all starts with inside the transaction with absolute accuracy. Mm -hmm. Who or what am I dealing with? And we just keep building out against that and against one ID. And then all of the artifacts that we get from our addressing businesses, as well as now threat analytics, risk, fraud, and compliance, just continue to build the, the authoritative nature of that. So these were solution. capabilities you were building absent marketing, yes. just sort of build them, build them Now I can admit wholesale. it. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> and yet it looks, I mean, f f in the marketing world, it looks brilliant, right? Oh my God, they saw Honey, this it's coming. It's so accidental. Like, oh. It's so nice of yeah, you, but really okay. we're just like, we just stumbled into this. Um, we really started out, so what we, what our core businesses do are routing and addressing for all voice calls and text messages in North America. Mm -hmm. It's about six billion transactions a day. We um, route and address about 20% of all internet traffic globally, and we route and address um, text messages to eight billion phones globally. So that's 50, 55 billion transactions every day. We extract about 11 billion identifying updates from those 50 billion transactions every day. And the transaction volume is growing 30% a year. So it's just an increasing amount of data. Where am I seeing you on what IP address, what network, what country, yep. on what phone? That all associates back to your name. And then your credit profile, your risk profile, your marketing um, profile 
you know, have you ever been a member of anonymous profile? Right. And again, it's it's one asset that is then useful against transactions in, in basically at every vertical. So that sounds like a different pitch, a different positioning than many of the companies in this sector. Tell me a little bit about, you recently won the Procter & Gamble DMP uh, um, uh, business. Uh, how'd you win it and how'd you differentiate against pretty able competitors like mm -hmm. Salesforce and and Oracle, and do you bring that kind of discipline, that positioning that you just espoused, to, to, to the, that kind of discussion? Yes, so we start off by talking about the importance, if you're going to do people-based marketing, mm -hmm. you have to know who the people are, right. and you have to be accurate. And, and with marketing departments, if you start talking about their CRM, everybody's CRM is inaccurate, right? If you have 100 records that are correct at the beginning of year one, 43 are correct at the end of year two. Mm -hmm. And the rest of them are the valuable ones because they're moving around. So how do you maintain that with an accuracy interval of 15 minutes? That's kind of where we start. Why is it important that you care that you have accurate data? And then everything else flows from that. And to your point, because we've been doing this now for 20 years in the telecom industry, in the threat analytics industry, we create all of our solution sets with both privacy and security by design. Yep. So we're hypersensitive to the needs, particularly of financial institutions not to be breached, et cetera. Right. And while that hasn't been an issue in marketing, um, to date with the recent breaches, I think more folks are raising their antenna around those issues. And do you, is that, does that create margin opportunities? Can you charge a premium for the fact that you're more, you're selling security as, as part of these marketing services, um, or does it just enable your higher win rate? We haven't, we haven't looked at any kind of a premium pricing to, to what we think the value of the right. service is, so those attributes are embedded in the pricing for the right. service. We do think it's becoming more and more of a competitive dif differentiator. Right. You know, the, 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 the notion of accurate data is a, is a obviously it feels like that's a, that's like a duh, no-brainer. Uh, I was astounded, I remember this is dated, but uh, you know, Blue Kai in 2010, uh, I remember I was at a conference and they were bragging, like saying this in a positive manner, su suggesting that they could predict uh, gender 32% of the time, accurately 32% of the time. I'm like, give me a coin. <laughs> I can improve that by 18%. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, seemingly like ridiculous, but, but clearly in a people-based world, the guessing, the probabilistic uh, applications are, that's over, right? right. Uh, so known is, is, is absolutely essential. Um, tell me a little bit more, um, about, um, the, the, I, I want to talk about one of the trends uh, we talked about was these new breed of buyers, new breed of strategics coming into this sort of marketing and, and media intermediation uh, ecosystem, companies like telcos. And, you know, I, I, I've spent a lot of time in the telco world in the 90s, that was my whole life. Is In fact, uh, my, Bless you. My, yeah, exactly, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, my, uh, my byline is the first half of my career was uh, advising big media and telcos. The second half of my career uh, was advising digital companies, and I'm pretty sure the third half of my career is uh, going to be at the intersection of the two. So you have a telco background, and in those days we talked a lot about five nines, right? Mm -hmm. Five nine reliability, which means your network had to be up, had, had to have 99.999% uh, uh, uptime which means less, about five minutes per year of, of, of any downtime. It was that kind of standard, that kind of network standard that the telcos are used to. Clearly, that's not a concept that lives in the sort of media and marketing world, and yet now we've got companies like Verizon, like Comcast, like AT&T, like Singapore Telecom, like Altice, coming into the media and marketing sector do you see that as creating, uh, as sort of renewing, upping the standards? Because they take a different view mm -hmm. towards those kind of. Well, again, in our traditional addressing businesses, yep. we have to have 5.9 reliability, right? I can't say I don't feel like completing your phone call or I don't feel like routing this tweet. We've got to do it globally. Um, I do think that those companies both bring a different level of expectation around uptime but more importantly around data privacy, and particularly Verizon after the super cookie incident right. um, is, is very aware of the need to protect its data, very aware of kind of the need to partner with larger companies who have equal standards around, again, data, privacy, security, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I think 
no matter what's going on in the capital markets with respect to some of the smaller companies, I also think changing standards for partnering with large companies around data usage is, is going to have a negative effect on some of the tinier guys. Yep. Um, so another thing happened in the, in the last two years since you, since you were here last. You, uh, as a public uh, company, had, a, had made an announcement uh, um, a little over a year ago um, that you were going to split the business into two, the sort of the MarTech, for lack of a better uh, word, uh, side of things with government there, yeah, yeah. services. Yeah, the, the multiples are higher. Trust me, go, go with this, Lisa, go with this. Uh, not that it matters anymore because, uh, so you announced the intention to split the business. I'm going to guess out of frustration the public markets really didn't value that aspect, uh, growing aspect of, of your business. Uh, and, and I had made the prediction, I think I mentioned to you, I certainly mentioned to, uh, to others that um, that would likely not be a long-lived independent business. Uh, I think I referenced the uh, scene out of uh, Wall Street where, you know, Bud Fox, uh, you know, the uh, Gecko's lawyer says to Bud Fox, look, kid, you're going to be the shortest, you know, CEO in the tenure of Blue Star Airlines. Because <laughs> uh, my guess would have been you would announce the split and on day two, Oracle or IBM or someone would have just come along and made a bid, bid for the for the MarTech side because it's a it's a nice collection, juicy collection of of MarTech capabilities. And yet, before you got there, uh, Golden Gate, a large uh, Bay uh, Area private equity firm, uh, took you private. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about that. Um, I'm a, a, in many ways astounded that they could do the the calculus of what you were worth on, on the other side of the business, because you do have a, a, a pending uh, a contract uh, issue there. How is it that they got there, and, and what are the sort of, why Golden Gate, I guess? Well, so first of all, after 30 earnings calls, I'm so happy to be private. You have no yeah. idea. And Jeff, <laughs> Jeff, it's going to be miserable over the long term. Um, <laughs> so, you know, honestly, just standing up and giving your report card every four months is, it's just hideous. Um, anyway, so um, how did Golden Gate get there in terms of valuation? They wound up um, coming in at a 48% premium to our trading price, and we announced the deal last December. That's how you got there. Which made, by the way, our um, public company shareholders wildly happy. Yes. Some of them are already calling and asking when we're going out again, and the answer is never. <laughs> um, why Golden Gate? They, the founder of Golden Gate is a long-term investor in information services, mm -hmm. which is, has been historically a very poorly defined sector. Uh, there are usually two or three companies in each vertical that are defined as information services companies, and they all have the same attributes. They start with unique or hard to replicate data sets that inform a high volume of decisions and then up to workflow solutions. So if you think about companies like Thomson Reuters, or Experian, or CoStar in Realty, or Verisk in Insurance. They viewed us as, a, as an information services company because of the, database, the identity database that we had built and the multiple uses for it. And by the way, information services companies trade at 17 times EBITDA and up over a period of 20 years. So it's a really beautiful, tiny sector to be in. They also understood on the flip side, we've got a $500 million contract in the telecom environment that will theoretically go away one day. Um, they also understood how difficult it would be to ever actually transition that. Mm -hmm. And so believed there, that there was an upside option on that side. So we were just fortunate to find a group of people who understand information services, understand telecom IT, were willing to pay the premium. And from the management's point of view, they're a phenomenal investor. Um, their average hold period is eight to 10 years. They have a permanent fund structure. So unlike many PE firms where you are acquired, you are immediately in cost cutting mode, right. and then you get flipped, um, they're telling us to plan on an eight to 10 year horizon at a minimum and already looking at acquisitions. So you re-upped your contract, a 10 year yes. contract, you employment contract. I said five, I mean, <laughs> you know, you don't want some old five, chick five, running yeah. a tech company, um, <laughs> but we'll see when we get there. 
And uh, the, uh, Golden Gate, uh, in the, it's their MO that not only do they have these long hold times, but they use their sort of core investment as a, as a um, anchor tenant, if you will, and then build upon that with lots of acquisitions. They uh, uh, showed me a few case studies where they'd done upwards of like 30 acquisitions uh, for any particular base company. Is that something that you've discussed with them? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> It's the Investment Banking Full Employment Act. Um, and I guess, and obviously you get to do we'll that. We'll know each other for a long time. Exactly. Undercover as a private company. Yeah. So no one's going to be meddling as to whether this deal was accretive or not and you know, how it affects you know, your, your, your next quarters. I mean, I would say, so as a public company, we were really fortunate to have a board that was highly supportive of our strategy. Yep. But if you look at our share price performance over the period against which we were pivoting and acquiring, we had a pretty rocky go of it. So I had a very courageous public board. Yep. I would tell you most public boards would not have right. gone down this path, particularly because when we started out in 2010 and said, look, we're going to use all of our addressing solutions to build an authoritative identity company, um, we hired Bain, a small consulting firm, to work with us for six months on the strategy. And at the end, they stood up and said to my board, this is idiotic, you should sell the company. You have less than an 8% chance of success. Again, most public boards would have fired me or sold right. the company. Um, my board was fortunately quite oppositional mm -hmm. and just said, let's go. Right. Um, so, so in that sense, it was great. In the sense of standing up and giving that report card, um, you know, the market share acquisition, for instance, was phenomenally strategic for us. Right. We got hammered in the public markets. Yes. So to your point now, not sort of not having to go through that and mm -hmm. constantly justify our strategic moves in a public environment will, will be terrific. And with short sellers, because right. you know, it's a big game. It is a big game. Jeff can tell you a little bit about short sellers, um, but they're all hurting so far. They're all yours now. Um, so $2.9 billion was your go private valuation. You're a sizable company and yet, Compared to some of the other folks that are sharing this, you know, main stage, we just heard from Adobe. We've got IBM and 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 Oracle, you know, coming up this afternoon. Those are giants. How, how do you fit in a world where they're got obviously market caps and massive capabilities? They sort of have an approach, a full sort of Martech stack approach. Do you compete? Do you complement? How do you fit in with those giants? We're actually partnered with all three of them yep. in certain ways. Um, Again, our focus is quite different. I'm going to slap you if you call me a MarTech company again. <laughs> Information services. Okay. 17 times EBITDA. Um, you know, 15 look, times revenue. Uh, <laughs> that will only last so long. Okay. When revenue growth starts to taper off, believe well, me, we'll, we'll be talking to Jonah this afternoon. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, it, plus, we've also got 35 cents of every revenue dollar falling to cash. So it's. It's a nice acquisition environment. I, you know, I think, A, we're partnered with them. We have a very different set of assets. Yep. We have a very different focus. So the intelligence actually flows through most of their, these clouds. You, you partner with all of them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and we don't see ourselves as competing. We're just, we're basically in a different space, which is who or what is on the other end of the transaction and what are the attributes that you should look at when you're, when you're dealing with them. And that fits actually quite nicely into most people's marketing clouds. Awesome. Well, Lisa, uh, I, I, what, what I really appreciate is your is your candor. Now that you're a private company CEO, I'll get even more crazy. So, so I can say anything. Right, and 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 I'm just so glad that she's unshackled because you know two years ago as a public company CEO, you know she had to limit her, her comments, which is why she opened with penis enlargement two years ago. Yes. Uh, her words, not mine. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. <laughs>